she just sort of casually says, look, don't wear a skirt tomorrow because there's going to be a guy under your desk where you're cooking. And I, I beg your pardon. My family and I had been living in this funny little sort of shack um, while we built a house on this block of land. And we spent, it was meant to be six months, and we ended up spending two years in there. And I had no kitchen and it was really tough going, but, my, you know, I think it's character building. The boys all <laughs> had great character after that. And while we were in there, I just sort of said to my husband, Mick, we'd never had Foxtel or any kind of streaming TV before. And I said, when we move into this new house, we're going to get Foxtel. You can watch all the sport you want. And what happened was um, I discovered the Lifestyle Food Channel. <laughs> and, of course, I'm in my beautiful new kitchen watching Lifestyle Food all day long and I got hooked on the UK version of MasterChef with, uh, you know, Greg Wallace and John Turode and I loved it and I loved watching these people, just a little civilised little cooking competition it was where people would turn up for a few weeks, they'd they'd cook, they went home every night and after about six weeks somebody was a winner but they had all improved and learned things and looked like they had enormous fun. And so when there was a contestant call for Australia, the Australian MasterChef, I thought, oh, I like I love that show and it looks like fun. And so I applied not knowing what it was going to be, like had no idea what it was going to be. I thought it was just going to be the same as the British version, which it was not. Um, but my best friend said to me, um, you have to apply, you have to apply. And, and she pestered me right up until, because the application was huge. Like I ended up having to take half day off work to fill it in. It was huge. And she said to me the day before it was due, if you don't fill that in, um, you're never allowed to talk to me about food again. So I went, oh, man, that's brutal. So I did, and now she takes all the credit. And when I got accepted, I didn't know until I made it to the top 50 out of 7,500 people, I got to the top 50 before they said, oh, by the way, you have to live out of home to compete. And I remember that conversation with Mick saying, I have to actually live in a house in Sydney. What I didn't know until I moved into that house was that they were going to take my computer off me and my phone off me and I was not going to have any unsupervised contact with my family for quite some time. On the UK version, you don't see their house. You don't you don't see their homes, but they put us all together into one house, very big house, um, and they because they didn't quite know what was going to go to air, how it was all going to hang together because it was season one, they filmed us all day long. So there were cameras there in the morning. We got filmed putting our makeup on and brushing our teeth. You know, there were cameras there at night. There was this whole thing like now when someone's eliminated, everybody's there and they get to have a hug and say goodbye. But in season one, everybody left. And then they would film us sitting in our lounge room at the house waiting to see who came back. And that person just vanished. You didn't get to say goodbye to them. It was They just disappeared off the face of the earth. And uh, yeah, so it was a very, very different experience. If we were filming six days a week. We were doing work experience on Sundays in restaurants. They were placing us in restaurants to do work experience. And um, so it was, uh, it was big. It was really, really big. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything about it because I actually think that some of the reason that I made it all the way through to the end was that I could tough out some of that stuff and it, it, some of it wasn't about the cooking. Some of it was a head game and you just had to be able to tough out those long hours and, and all of that. And back then I could do that. Nowadays, not so much. I don't want to. <laughs> it was so strange. I had no, like I had no idea what was going to happen when I when I applied. And, um, yeah, it, it was so strange. And, the nature of the show is that people feel like they know you because, you know, you've been in their lounge room and it was on six nights a week, season one. And so you've been in people's lounge room every night except for Saturday night and so they feel like they know you. So I had like total strangers come up to me and, and kiss me on the face in the shopping centre, you know, just just really overwhelming, like beautiful. Nobody abused me to my face. Well, the internet's a whole other thing but um it, it was amazing. And my, my boys, they were in year five, year six and year seven when all of that happened and they just took it in their stride. We'd be walking through the shops and people had stopped to chat and, you know, my oldest son would say, do you want a photo? And he'd take a photo and, you know, people discuss with me what's in my shopping trolley or, or they'll stop me in the aisle of the supermarket to ask for recipe tips and it, it, 
It was just extraordinary. It was extraordinary. I was really fortunate because at the same time as I won, and we we did win a cookbook, I think, for the first few years. That's not on the table anymore. But at the same time, I was given a job with the Australian Women's Weekly as a columnist. And so they trained me because um, as far as food magazines go, the Australian Women's Weekly is like top top standard. Um, Everything's, you know, triple tested. The recipes are all written. very diligently and so they trained me in the way that recipes ought to be written so I had that support when I was writing my own cookbook but also and the nature of that book was that I went out to my extended family and my closest friends and said what are, what are your food memories and what are the recipes that meant the most to you and so I have in that book there's quite a lot of mixed grandmother's baking recipes you know that I've had to modernize obviously because grandma doesn't put all the details in and it's all in ounces and all that sort of thing. So I, I got to draw on the beautiful memories and resources of, of others to to write that book. Um, but, yeah, I certainly had support from the weekly. And once you get into the flow of that, it's a real discipline recipe writing. You can't just chuck bits and pieces in and taste it, which is how I cook. Um, you have to record everything. And um, so, yeah, it was a real learning curve. But um, when I when I got that book in my hands, my nan passed away only a few days after the finale, um, went to air, and my mother-in-law only two weeks after that. That book contained so much of them. Um, it was overwhelming to have that published. There's so many things. I I pinch myself and still, you know, 14 years later, I still shake my head in wonder at some of the stuff that happens, you know, um, some of the things that my family have been able to do because of masters chef you know but in terms of highlights one of my favorite moments was um because I, I was the resident cook on the today show uh for a few years and the producer rang me the day before I was due to come in and she just sort of casually says look don't wear a skirt tomorrow because there's going to be a guy under your desk where you're cooking and I <laughs> I beg your pardon she said just wear jeans or something I'm like what do you mean there's going to be a guy? Oh, she says, oh, um, you're cooking with Kermit the Frog tomorrow. I like screamed and threw my phone. I had to go find the phone and I, I started to cry. Like I am, I love Kermit the Frog. I've always loved Kermit the Frog. I, I used to play the rainbow connection to my pregnant belly for all three of my babies. And the next day I went and I cooked with Kermit the Frog. I completely forgot there was a human being under the desk. It was just me and my little green friend. And I just thought, look at me, if you could have told my four, five, six-year-old self that one day I'd be next to Kermit the Frog having a chat with him, oh, I just I just don't even know what I would have done. I wouldn't have believed it. Totally, totally different. I think the industry has evolved. Certainly the production has evolved. Um, contestant welfare is much more highly prized than it was. And, you know, I had to make sure that things were going to be okay before I agreed to go back on it just because I I was in a place where I, I didn't really think it would be great for my mental health um, to put myself in under that kind of stress. But they, you know, the production were very, very um, generous with me in terms of what um, they would allow for me to do. You know, I, I just said things to them like, I, I have to have eight hours of sleep a night. I can't just, I can't work till midnight and get up at five. That doesn't happen anymore. And <laughs> they're like, no, we don't operate like that anymore. And, you know, I was allowed um, access to my psych, even though we were filming. I was allowed um, to drive my car down to Melbourne so that I could go get up early and go for a swim before filming and things like that. So they, the contestant welfare is super high priority now. There's, there's lots of things, but I really, um, really, what MasterChef taught me and Mick, my husband, is that you you can have plans but you shouldn't be overly committed to them because opportunities come a knocking. And, you know, we made a decision back when, you know, I found out that I would have to walk out of my business, leave my home, leave Mick alone with the boys and live um, away from them to compete on this show. We, we decided that we didn't want to die wondering what if. So my bucket list is short because if I start writing it, I think it'll be too long. And what I what I really want to do is just um, keep myself open to all the possibilities that are still out there for me. I honestly think that 
there are times when I'm doing something that has happened because of MasterChef, something like I've worked with Oxfam on their Grow campaign, I've worked with, you know, Cure MND, I'm working now with Beyond Blue. There are times where I think, well, what MasterChef did for me is not only give me opportunities for myself and for my family, but it's given me a little bit of leverage to speak for other people and to um, to have a bit of a voice in some areas that I think need a bit of um a bit of amplification and and a bit of attention. For me, it's, it's, that's the privilege of the whole thing is just being able to um, have a voice in some of those areas. Just get in there and be be yourself, be your true authentic self, and and that that'll be enough. And you know, be open to possibilities and opportunities. Grab it with two hands. If you are privileged enough to be a part of that production, just make the most of it because it's wonderful and. Thousands and thousands of people would love to be in a position.